give people a minute to connect to audio. All right, well, welcome everyone to the July 7th uh, meeting of the Portland Clean Energy Fund Grants Committee. We're going to um, start, as we always do, with a participation um, check, which is just sort of going over how we all participate in, um, in the Zoom world um, in our public meetings. So the guidelines um, that are applied to virtual meetings are the chat box is open for introductions, and I would invite everyone, um, members of the public, and also staff who are just observing to um, put their names, organizational affiliations, if you have one, if you want to share your, your gender pronouns, to put those into the chat box now, and we can make sure and read those out when we go around and do introductions. The raise hand function is reserved for committee members, and we do also ask that um, staff who are participating in the meeting and committee members um, keep their cameras on if they can and that other folks keep their um, keep their cameras off. Public um, members of the public will are, are generally muted unless there is an opportunity for engagement as there is at every other meeting, though not this one. This one, um, we're having the 15 minute break is for sort of the team building exercise, but on the first Wednesday of every month, there is that opportunity for more dialogue. There is always an opportunity for public comment. And so um, if you want to provide public comment tonight, just go ahead and indicate that you want to do that in the chat box as well. And um, we'll ask you to unmute yourself and turn your camera on if, you're, if you want to um, during the public comment period. This meeting is being recorded and it is also being live streamed um, on YouTube. And then there will be a recording of, of the meeting for if folks want to um, check that out later that is stored on that YouTube site. There's also closed captioning available in the meeting. And you can find that by going up to your Zoom. If you're, if you're watching on Zoom, you can find that by going up to your little Zoom menu bar and finding those three dots with the word more under them. And if you click on that, then you can um, go down and you can see the live, live transcription. So we started a few minutes late today. So the agenda is, um, and frankly, it's kind of just always, always the way it goes. We start a few minutes late and the agenda is a few minutes behind and then we catch up at some point or we don't. But um, with that, I'm gonna, for folks who came in a little bit late, just a reminder that you can, um, put your name if you have an organizational affiliation and your gender pronouns into the chat box so that we can um, kind of capture that you're here and also introduce you when we go around and do introductions. And also that's the place where you would indicate if you have an interest in providing public comment tonight. So before we get started, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam to do kind of a meeting opening. Thank you, Katie. Okay, I'm muted. And I just, I, I wanted to open this meeting and just acknowledge, you know, that late last month, um, you know, for folks that were here in, in the Portland area, we suffered catastrophic, a catastrophic heat wave in the city and region. I mean, here in Multnomah County alone, we lost, as of, as of uh, yesterday, 67 lives due to extreme heat through hyperthermia. Um, it, along with the ice storms this winter, the wildfire last summer and so many more other events are, are certainly a painful reminder of the impacts of climate change and those in our community who face the most tragic of those burdens. I'm thankful the county and so many others made cooling spaces available. However, we know that many that lost their lives did so alone at home with no air conditioning. Those people that died as a result of the heat ranged in age from 44 years to 97 with an average age of 68. These events are consistent with the worst case climate models for the Pacific Northwest. We know there is worse to come in the absence of climate action. And so given these circumstances, the importance of our work together cannot be understated. I'm proud of the work we get to do together and look forward to making resiliency, climate resiliency and other investments alongside you all in the community that, that can hopefully prevent deaths like these in our community in the future. So I just wanna thank you all for being here. Thanks, Sam. I'm going to move to introductions, and we'll start with committee members and then move on to staff. Um, we'll start with Robin. 
Uh, good evening, Robin Wang, um, committee member Hiem. Jeffrey. Oh, you're muted. We'll come back to you, Jeff. No. We'll come back to you, Jeffrey. Faith. Mm. Hey, everybody. Faith Graham, she, her um, committee member. Amanda. Hi, everyone. Amanda Squimpignazzi, she, her committee member. Maria. Hello, Maria Sippen, she or they pronouns, committee member. Michael. Uh, good evening, Michael Eden Hill, he, him, uh, committee member. All right, let's try Jeffrey again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Right, perfect. Hi, everyone. Jeffrey Moreland, committee member, he, him. Thanks, Jeffrey. We're going to move on to staff introductions now, but I did see a, a couple of people joined a few minutes late. So um, for members of the public, if you want to put your name, if you have an organizational affiliation you want to share, and your gender pronouns into the chat box, we'll introduce you after um, getting through staff. So we'll start with James Valdez. Hi, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Uh, James Valdez, he, him pronouns, and piece of staff. Janet. Good evening, everybody. Janet Hammer, she, her pronouns, piece of staff. Jay. Hello, everybody. Jay Richmond, piece of staff. And we do have, I think, these are, those are sort of the that piece of staff who are going to be actively participating um, in tonight's meeting. Others who might be listening, just go ahead and throw your information into the chat box. I'm Katie Lister, piece of staff, um, she, her pronouns, and I will pass it to Sam. Folks, Sam Brasso, piece of staff, I'm playing your tech lead this evening as well, uh, he, him pronouns. And of the folks in the audience, we've also got um, our piece of staff member, Jason Ford, he, him, Jenny Hall, she, her from Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Program, Will, apologies, Will, if I get your last name wrong, um, Lang. Uh, he, him of SEIU Local 49, Jen Latu, she, her of PGE. Okay. Thanks, Sam. So I think that we will, and it doesn't, oh, and Chris Grube, she, her with Home Builder, uh, Home Performance Contractors Guild just popped up in the chat. So just a quick run through of the agenda tonight. Um, we're doing many things in sort of 20 minute increments um, up until the break. And then we're spending a kind of a little bit of a larger chunk of time on workforce and contractor development grants. Um, I did also just want to note that we have committee members, um, Megan Horst, Renfe Ciatoro, and, um, and Shanice are not able to join us tonight, but um, we do have a quorum. And so we're, we're good to go. And we actually are not making any decisions tonight um, anyway. Um, before we jump into the meeting, I wanted to ask if everybody, oh, except for this one decision we're about to make right now, if everybody had a chance to review um, the minutes from June, the June 2nd meeting. Those are the ones that you've had for a couple of weeks. We're not going to ask you to um, approve the ones that you just got, just got yesterday. So are there any changes, edits, comments, corrections? I'm seeing thumbs up from people and nods. Okay. So we will approve the minutes from the June 2nd meeting. And then um, we can just going to check real quick the chat box. It doesn't look like anyone signed up for public comment. So we can move into um, some just some quick program updates from Sam before we jump into a policy update from James. All right, I'm just bringing this timeline back up to kind of ground us in where we're trying to go and where we are. <clears throat> so as um, today, we're gonna be right there chatting about, and we're catch hopefully catching up on a couple of things. We're talking about land building acquisition, workforce development, contractor support grants, and coming back to the grant cap. 
In our next meeting in July, we're going to come back and bring forward the evaluation findings. You all receive a long form memo with a range of the findings and starting to outline with how they're going to play out and the changes into the, the, the first draft of the RFP. We'll hopefully discuss there. Then we'll come back on August 4th, continue to discuss hopefully with some refinements and feedback and fingers crossed, um, and it may take a little bit more, release the RFP around that date. Um, we'll come back potentially in the middle of August with a public listening session around with, with, with focused feedback. And I think we're gonna be drawing particular, you know, drawing folks' attention to specific areas that have changed, um, but, but doing a public listening session in August, middle of August, and then, coming back with changes and a review of some of the co comments in, in early September with the idea of, and I hope that we can release the RFP in September 22nd and keep it open for 60 days from there. Um, outside of that, we're, we are, uh, it, we're, we're largely busy still onboarding grantees, but, but also um, gearing up and getting ready. And a lot of our work has certainly been focused on drafting and developing the, the next RFP. So we're, we're, we're excited and eager to bring some of that findings back, some of those initial drafts back to you all on the 21st. Um, last meeting, we talked about the audit, which uh, Michael and Shanice um, have been engaged in. And so we did have our audit conference with the auditor, or, or with the auditor's office on, uh, I think it was June 22nd. And since then, they, they heard a lot of our feedback and have been working on it. So it's gonna take from the initial feedback that we've heard from the auditor's office, it's given just the, the, some of the feedback and the conversations we had, it's gonna take a little bit longer in order for, uh, in order for them to come back and, and, and respond with, 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 what looks, with, 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 a resp with a draft that we can respond to. Um, so there's, I will keep you all up to date on the timeline. I, I don't actually have a sense for the exact timeline, but we'll be meeting with the auditor's office early next week to hopefully get a little bit more clarity on what the timeline is gonna look like. Um, and so as part of that, I just wanted to acknowledge that Faith has, Faith has tossed their hat into to, to support in, in some of the audit response, but, but there's, there's room for an additional committee member if an additional committee member is interested in, in joining alongside Michael and Maria um, to co-draft a response with us. I believe Rand uh, is also Maria's expressed. Michael Sorry, Michael, Rand is Rand also, Fies. yeah. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you for the update, Michael Marie. I appreciate that. <laughs> I see your hand face. I'll call it. Are you calling on me? <laughs> I thought <it> <laughs> I just um certainly my job, we Dan. We don't need to um, we don't need to talk about this now, but if there's anyone else that wants to do that, I know we, there's room for four and I'd be very happy to step aside for someone who would like to do that. But I'm also willing to serve in that role. So just opening that up if there's somebody that wants to serve in that role, please throw your hat in, throw your name in that. OK, cool. All right. Are we ready to move on, Sam? And I'll just, I'll just acknowledge, we had a couple more people join since, um, and it looks like we all had Jay Ward of Energy Trust Award and join the meeting. Jay, it's good to see you. All right, James, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can just uh, give me a signal when you want me to advance the slides. All right, sounds great. Um, yeah, uh, it's great to be with you all here tonight. And um, again, my name is James Valdez, and he him pronouns member of the PSEF team here. And one of my roles on the team is to track and engage with uh, policy issues that have a potential to impact uh, the PSEF program or are kind of related to PSEF um, in kind of the legislative uh, arena as well as other organizations that have intersections with PSEF. So, the 2021 Oregon Legislative Session just wrapped up a little over a week and a half ago on June 27th, and it was a unprecedented session in, in so many ways um, in the way that it had to operate uh, in the virtual world of the pandemic, um, though also in person to do key votes. Um, and there were hundreds of bills passed that impact all sorts of issues in people's lives um, and related to pandemic response, related to police reform, economic issues, um, 
land use, all sorts of things. But I wanted to highlight and come to the PSEP committee with an update on some bills that passed that are tangentially related to, to PSEP or could, could have impacts um, on, on projects or are related to especially clean energy and equity elements of our energy infrastructure. And so I'll go ahead and go to the next, next slide. So I'm going to just go through a kind of very high level review of some of the bills that passed um, that are mostly related to the energy space. Uh, but just know that there's a lot of other, other policy elements that um, we're also tracking and that the city of Portland prioritized and that even impact issues within the Bureau of Planning Sustainability, land use, building codes, vehicle electrification, all sorts of other things. But I wanted to, for this, um, for this, this context, focus on a few major buckets of, of legislative action that um, passed this, this session. The first is a suite of bills that were brought uh, by a coalition called the Clean Energy Opportunities Campaign and involved opportunities for reducing energy burden, for increasing renewable energy generation uh, for, the, for the utilities that provide electricity to Oregonians, and also investing in uh, healthy homes and upgrades for the health of uh, occupied spaces and focusing on low-income housing. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about in detail of all of those. Also, there were a couple bills that are related to uh, renewable energy labor elements and that impact prevailing wage rates, um, as well as allocations of funding or kind of opportunities for extension of existing programs that we have now uh, that are managed by both Oregon Department of Energy in the case of the third bullet point there, House Bill 5006, and Energy Trust of Oregon, and extending and slightly modifying uh, the structure that, that authorizes their uh, programs. So we'll go to the next slide. So the first topic I really want to talk about is the Clean Energy Opportunities Campaign, which was a huge coalition of nonprofit organizations and advocates that came together really over the past few years in putting together a platform for a clean and just energy future for the state of Oregon. And what you'll see on the left here is the key steering committee members who were part of the campaign and on the right side of the, the, the screen here, some of the core other nonprofit advocates who helped provide support for the campaign, including uh, you'll see the city of Portland there as one of the supporters. The model of leadership for the campaign really was, um, was based on and I think built on lessons learned from the Portland Clean Energy Fund and was one where EJ organizations provided the leadership and policy direction and then the larger organizations, many of which are better resourced and have greater capacity and privilege of resources, provided support, technical analysis, and really helped also in the advocacy space. And so you'll see a lot of names that you might be familiar with um, that were part of the PSEF campaign in the steering committee. And really just want to highlight that you know the, this element of leadership worked. Uh, this campaign was very successful, uh, the way that PSEP was as well, in putting together ideas that centered racial and social equity and justice, that move us towards a cleaner, healthier economy, that have labor standards, and that really kind of holistically look at the challenges that we have with climate and who benefits from different solutions. And so I'll go to the next slide which talks about some of the key bills um, that and really the, the platform of bills, which were three bills that were advanced by the Clean Energy Opportunities Coalition. And really just huge kudos to all the advocates and people who worked on these because all three passed. Some of them came down to the wire um, in the last few days of, of legislative session, but they really built broad support. And utilities got on board, labor got on board, um, there was a there was a broad coalition of support even outside of the organizers. I will say um, many of these bills passed on partisan lines or you know had very very few uh, Republican votes, but they passed and they also many of these are also delivering a lot of benefits to rural or, or rural parts of Oregon 
we even in districts where maybe the there wasn't as much uh, legislative support, but there'll still be quite a bit of benefit to all Oregonians for these policies. So the three bills, I'll just briefly describe them. These are the campaign descriptions, but there's a lot nested in here, and I'm not going to have an opportunity to go into all the policy details of each one. But broadly, the first was around energy affordability, or affordability House Bill 20, 2475. This has been a multi-year effort by advocates to create what's known as a low-income rate class or an opportunity for lower energy rates for low-income households so to reduce the energy burden or the amount of the uh, household's income that goes towards paying for heating and electricity in their home. And so this authorizes the Public Utility Commission to develop and implement a low-income utility rate class also, it provides an opportunity for increased intervener funding or for representation of nonprofit organizations, community groups to be paid for their engagement in the Public Utility Commission rulemakings and to really meaningfully expand representation of interests and of environmental justice within the utility regulatory space. The second bill is one called Healthy Homes, which House Bill 2842 which created a new $10 million fund to be managed by the Oregon Health Authority to support upgrades that really address health and safety issues in people's homes. So this could be radon mitigation, mold mitigation, um, necessary home repairs for people's health or addressing kind of immediate impacts. Um, also things like doing re wholesale replacement of manufactured homes in places where there's a lot of old manufactured homes that are falling apart or that really aren't um, cost effectively uh, upgradable, but are, are it's a better approach to just replace them. So $10 million was allocated to this new program. And then the most kind of multi-layered one and really very impactful element of this as well is House Bill 2021, which is a platform um, called 100% Clean Energy for All. and includes a variety of different targets for decarbonizing or getting fossil fuels out of our electricity grid by 2040 and getting to 100% clean grid by 2040 for the, for the investor-owned utilities that, that serve large part of Oregon, but also the two that serve Portland, Pacific Power and Portland General Electric. So this sets new aggressive targets, which are really the most ambitious right now in the US um, of 100% fossil, fossil or 100% clean energy which also means fossil free by 2040 and an 80% reduction of the emissions of that energy by 2030 with some interim goals in between. It also prohibits the construction of new natural gas plants within, within the state of Oregon. It also has an allocation for community renewable investments of $26 million per biennium with a kind of maximum of $50 million authorized long-term it also has labor standards for the construction and investment of uh, the, these, these energy resources and really labor standards that help increase um, the recruitment of apprentice, apprentices and help provide a, a living wage for people who work in the field. Um, there also is the creation of something called the municipal green tariff structure, which allows local jurisdictions like Portland and Multnomah County and other cities that have even more aggressive climate action goals to be able to design and engage with the utilities in procuring even cleaner power on a, on a faster time frame to meet local, local climate goals and to also put in um, appropriation or you know, the, the opportunity to procure locally generated power as part of that. And so all of this is a huge and complex policy um, that will be implemented in rulemaking over the coming years, over the next really you know year and a half or two years, and has the potential for a huge amount of impact and growth and job generation within the state of Oregon. So really, you know, huge kudos to everybody who worked to pass these these bills, because it is a transformation of our energy system on a much more accelerated timeline than people even thought possible a few years ago. We'll go to the next. Next slides. And so I'm brief, just briefly going to talk about a couple rated labor related bills that passed. Um, Senate Bill 338 was a slight 
change to a program called the uh, Limited Renewable Technician or LRT program, which just allows uh, solar apprentices or LRTs to work on projects that are larger than residential scale um, and kind of go up to a 50 kilowatt or small commercial scale projects. Previously, LRTs were only um, allowed to work on projects that were smaller in scale, more around 15 kilowatts. So this expands the opportunities for that workforce certification to fill a broader role within the solar industry. Also, Senate Bill 493 um, was related to prevailing wages. Our program at PSEF does have prevailing wage requirements where on large projects where wage um, classifications exist. And this is a minor change, but it um, changes the rates to be based on collective bargaining agreement rates where, again, where they exist instead of a wage survey approach. Um, and so this also will create a little bit more consistency um, throughout, throughout the state, which has you know, both positives and negatives, but overall will increase wages um, for people who work in roles where prevailing wages exist. Next slide. And then there's a, a couple policies that passed related to uh, providing um, incentives or kind of, you know, a longer term opportunity for resilience and equity within the energy space. And so um, the first one that I'll mention here is House Bill 3141, which um, extends the opportunity for Energy Trust of Oregon's authorization as, a, as an entity um, and also reallocated some of the costs between kind of the energy efficiency funding and made that permanent and also created a, a new um, authorization for Energy Trust of Oregon to explicitly look at social equity within their programs and energy resilience as part of the elements that they can fund, set goals towards, and then go to the PUC with programs to address. So this is really huge. Um, and I know we have some friends from Energy Trust on, on, on the, on the, in the meeting here in the audience. And um, yeah, just really, really happy to see this long-term vision um, expanding into social justice and resilience as part of Energy Trust authorization moving forward. There was also a new kind of reallocation of an existing program that had almost sunsetted at Oregon Department of Energy. And House Bill 5006 provided a $10 million allocation for a rebate that is for solar and, and or solar and energy storage projects. This rebate works as a uh, a rebate that the installer can apply for that brings down the cost of installation of solar for the person who it's being installed on its property or for the organization that is benefiting from, from that installation. Um, and the previous version of this, this program had a 25% allocation for projects that serve low-income households or where there's a nonprofit organization that is, you know, for instance, a, um, a housing, a transitional housing shelter or an entity that serves low-income populations, that they also have the opportunity to uh, have a separate allocation for funding in this program and a higher incentive than kind of the market rate incentive. So also very excited that Oregon Department of Energy, or ODO as they're known, um, has the opportunity to continue expanding and rolling out uh, the, this program and hope that in their rulemaking that will also keep the elements of the low income allocation that they had in the previous version. So I'm, I want to just briefly go to the next, next, next slide. Just briefly talk about uh, some elements of where there's overlap or potential intersection between some of these new programs and also where there's not. Um, and so three of those elements that I mentioned, the Energy Trust of Oregon, the Odo Solar and Storage Rebates and the Healthy Homes could be connected with projects that PCEP applicants also apply for. Um, there would be a theoretical, theoretical path for a PCEP applicant to apply for multiple streams of funding and put together a request that asks for uh, funding from Energy Trust, from ODO, from OHA, and from PCEP to make the project happen. They wouldn't necessarily need to. You know, as we know in PCEP, we don't have a leverage requirement. We could fully fund projects as well. Um, but these are kind of the intersections of potential connection between organizations that could access other rebates as well. And the, the, what I'll say is that the relative scale of 
these is, is, is shown, but it's not like to exact scale. Uh, in terms of the annual amount of money that these programs have um, in providing incentives or rebates for, for clean energy projects. What you'll see over on the right side is that that Community Renewable Investment Fund that was created by House Bill 2021 is, is not eligible for Portland-based projects. And advocates who helped put together that bill recognize that there's a lot of resources that we do have within the Portland area for clean energy projects that focus on social and racial equity. And so there was a need in the rest of the state to be able to allocate funds and kind of have those separated. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I won't go into the, 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 the details of exactly how each, each program operates and kind of the qualification of different, different programs because we don't have time. Um, but just wanted to provide an overview of where there's potential intersection with PSEP projects. And go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, additionally, in addition to everything that just happened at the legislative side of things in the 2021 session, there's items at the Oregon Public Utility Commission or the PUC, which also have the opportunity to, to, impact, up, to impact the PSEP projects in the future. And so um, I'll just briefly touch on a, a, a few of them. The first is that in 2021, community solar program launched, or in 2020, the community solar program launched. And that program is just still rolling out. And there's some key decisions that need to be made at the Public Utility Commission about the allocation of low income um, opportunities for participation, for how to address residential participation in the program, and how to create um, a meaningful path forward for small projects and those led by nonprofits. The utilities, PGE and Pacific Power are also right now in the process of doing something called distribution system planning or providing information about how they make investments in different parts of the distribution system within their, their network. So we're actively tracking that docket as well. And then as we get into the hopefully end of COVID, um, there are, are rules being determined and funding being allocated for how to address the end of the disconnection moratorium when utilities can, if they, if they choose, start disconnecting customers who have been unable to pay their, their bills and discussions about what sort of forgiveness mechanisms might be possible as well. And so um, just kind of a note that there's a lot happening, there'll be a lot of rulemaking and that we're keeping our eye on all of these things. Then go to the next slide. And so I'm out of time or um, a little over. And so just want to note that, you know, there's an opportunity here to dive deeper for, for committee members that are interested in some of the details of the policies that passed or how we'll engage. And we'll be sending out a doodle poll for those interested um, to schedule a lunch and learn to be able to have a deeper conversation about that. And so I maybe have time to field one question, maybe two. Um, but yeah, I guess Katie, you can tell me how much time we got. So I think that we could we could maybe do a five minutes before moving on to the to the next thing. Just recognizing there will be other opportunities for committee members. Are there any questions right now or comments? Uh, could you back the slide up one? Uh, one more. That one. Thank you. I recognize there's a lot going on here on the slide. Um, so, yeah, the if you have specific questions, feel free to. <laughs> one thing it might be, and might be useful, James, is just, I know there's that, that 200 million energy trust of Oregon, sort of that big piece to give a little bit of a sense of, of what that's their whole annual budget. So it's Cor sort of yeah, what correct. might so, be available to leverage for PSEP funds isn't that whole amount really. Yeah, I, I should have clarified. So that that's the approximate annual budget for the entire organization, which operates statewide in the, well, in the investor owned utility territories um, and does have kind of, I, I'd say, allocations for different utility ter territories as well as different programs. And so um, that should not be viewed as, you know, 
the amount available in, in Portland. And similarly, um, with the other rebates, you know, these are statewide, the Odo Solar and Storage rebates and the Oregon Health Authority Healthy Homes Program is also statewide. Um, and so, yeah, th it's not meant to, to be a representation of what's available in Portland at all. It's just kind of broad, broad scales of, of other entities that provide incentives for clean energy in the state. Well, I, I know that I know there's a lot of interest in this. Maybe what I'll just I'll just say I'll just say this just to wax a little poetic for a moment. Um, it, it's this um, you know there's a tremendous amount here, and I know the lunch and learn sessions will be really helpful for folks to dig in. But I just want to acknowledge that you know all of the so many of these things we see here. I mean, James, I'll say I have, I have fingerprints of James in many ways for many many years. I mean, this is. This year was incredibly instrumental and it all came together, but it's, it's, it's been years and years of work of, of so many folks. So, uh, so what you're seeing here is, is, is a tremendous amount. And, uh, and no doubt James has been, it has been instrumental in, that in, in the many years past and obviously on this. And so it's really, it's, it's heartening to see all this having come through. Yeah, th thanks Sam. And yeah, um, other advocates as well have been working on these policies for a very long time. Um, also wanted to highlight a, a comment that Jay Ward made and thank you. Uh, in the chat that the statewide budget for kind of the renewable resilience element is about $15 million total. So, you know, I should probably be more, more nuanced in how I'm making that like look as big as it is because it, it, it is very much broken up into different program areas. Thanks, James. It looks like in the chat, there's a, um, a fair amount of interest. So we, we'll make sure to get that due to pull out so that you can have a little bit more deeper dive with some committee members sooner Thank than Thank you all. Yeah, so we'll be, we'll be scheduling that in the next few, few weeks here um, and we can yeah, spend more time on all the details. All right. Thank you, James. Okay, I'm gonna pass it on to Sam now um, to talk about land and building acquisition. Um, and then we're gonna, the idea is that about, uh, we're gonna take a break at about five minutes till seven and then go um, from the seven to 7.15 time will be kind of the committee meeting team building. Um, but I'm gonna pass it on to Sam now. Thank you, Katie. And Katie, if you take a step, take a slide back again. Yeah, just so I can set the stage a little bit here. You know, as, as we come into the next RFP, you know, we've, we've talked about this. It's a substantially greater sum, and, and with $60 million, um, there's, there's, you know, we, we had a lot of lessons learned out of the first RFP. One, one of those, some of those lessons learned is just that folks are looking for more clarity around the various uses of funds. And so this conversation here is just how we can continue to provide further clarity because you know, we made, we said land building and acquisition was an eligible expense last round, but both for folks to be able to grasp their minds around exactly what that looks like, what are the boundaries, circumstances of that, it, it, we realized in a lot of the questions we had last RFP, just a lot of the back and forth, um, that uh, it, it, it's something that would benefit from a lot more clarity from us at the front end um, that can help folks craft better proposals and think about it well in advance. So that's really the context of this is that there's, it was an eligible expense last round. We've got a lot of questions, a lot of interest in it, and we realized we need to bring a lot more, just a little bit more clarity to it. And so it's, it's, it's that, that's what this next slide will start to will show. It's just some of that extra clarity. And then we'll revisit a little bit of other, other conversations we visited before too. So as we think about land building acquisition, it's a few ways I think in which we think about it. You know, the first is that we know, and we've heard and heard expressed interest in different organizations seeking out net zero um, or, or living building type of development. So these are buildings, campuses that are incredibly efficient, that contribute, you know, that operate using zero energy or even sometimes contribute more energy back into the grid. They're complex projects that are designed in, in complex ways. And so we, we, we know that those projects are of interest for a range of groups, whether they're developing affordable housing, community centers or others. And, and those are projects that, that folks have expressed and said, we're interested in this, how can PISA support this? And so what we're doing work in this current RFP is to define 
uh, a set amount so that it's a little bit more prescriptive and gives folks a little bit more certainty so that we're not breaking apart a particular project into each of the little widgets that are involved in a building, but instead saying, if you're building a, a living building or a net zero building, that we will fund up to a certain percentage. And, and, and I don't want to put a number on that because we're still working on that, but I want you to know that's how we're thinking about it. But a certain percentage that's inclusive of the design, the development, and land cost. So folks can think about that. So that's, that's, that's one way in which we're thinking about that, given that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a means to incentivizing folks to build new buildings or new campuses in, in ways that are substantially more efficient than, than the current code requires. Okay. And then as far as all other sort of land or building related, general land or building related acquisition costs, we want to provide a little bit more clarity. And so we'll just focus a little bit on the land and, and give a couple examples around eligible expenses, as well as how we think about what would be ineligible expenses around land acquisition. So when we think about eligible expenses for land acquisition, we would, we would suggest that, for instance, if someone wanted to do a community solar project where the, 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 the purpose of acquiring the land is to put community solar on there, that would be an eligible purpose, right? They, they, would, they would purchase land and the, the sole purpose of the land would be a community solar. Alternatively, you know, and we expect to see this in our regenerative ag portfolio, is if someone wanted to purchase land in order to do regenerative agriculture. Again, the purpose of the acquisition of the land is solely to for, for the purposes of one of our funding areas. It's either to create renewable energy or, or, um, or, or do renew, or regenerative agriculture. And, and, and similarly, uh, I, well, I'll go to the buildings in a second here. Um, and ineligible expenses, and this is just to give folks an example. Now, if someone wants to acquire uh, land for something that is not core to what we are doing, for instance, they want to they want to use PSEP funding to acquire land for affordable housing, we would say that's ineligible because, you know, while building a really efficient affordable housing project is great. We will fund the elements of that project that promote that efficiency, not necessarily the land since the, the land is essentially, you, you have to purchase land for the affordable housing, not necessarily for the efficiency improvements. And so just, just to give folks a little bit more description on when we're, when, when PSEP, when, when folks can use PSEP, it really needs to be directly tied to one of our funding areas and our, and, and, the, and the primary purpose of that project should line up with our funding areas. And so maybe I'll pause there. And so this is and so this is this is considered all this is all our, our what we're drafting up as part of putting into the RFP. I, I see Faith, I see your your face. So I, I know that there's already some questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and pause right there. Mm -hmm. I saw Faith's face as well. <laughs> uh, I should not have been on video, is what should have been. <laughs> okay. Maybe others can go before me. If there are questions. Michael? Um, just a quick question about net zero developments. Um, and this is like a technical question. Um, when something's considered net zero, does that include the carbon offsets of the construction itself, or is it just a building that? is uh, net zero in its, um, in its, uh, in its like duration and it, once it's inhabited. This gets to, uh, this get, Katie, I'm gonna look to see if you know, and, and James, similarly, I'd look to you if you wanted to come online, if you know, this get, there's an, L, so I know that a, a net zero is it certainly operational. It, right, but they, exactly, and, and there's different ways and different calculations, but operational is definitely part of it. Lifetime operations of a building should be net zero, but as far as the, the initial construction of it, I'm, 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 it depends on the sort of, sometimes it depends on the, the particular certification that they're, they're taking if they're combining it with a, certific, a lead certification or something else, because um, there's, there's different point systems to a lot of these things. James? Yeah, I I'm, think that that's what you were talking about, a much deeper I would just want to say what we were thinking was the operating, was the building operations, not necessarily the the embedded carbon, the carbon embedded in the materials. Although we do, we have been kind of one of the things we're contemplating for the next round of funding as an improvement, sort of contemplating how it would impact things is is a consideration for the embedded carbon in materials. 
only for new construction, not necessarily for, for renovation, but for new construction. So it's a little bit separate. Yeah, I, I would just say that, yeah, usually net zero is defined kind of as like the annualized energy inputs of the building versus what is offset then by onsite generation. Um, and it's sort of a, you know, a math problem. Um, but there is also conversation happening within the kind of green building world about looking at energy use throughout the year and optimizing building buildings for using as much energy generated on site as possible, not just a net metering relationship um, to, to kind of come up with that mathematical net zero. But it is in this context, kind of an annualized evaluation of energy into the building versus energy generated on site. I hope that helps. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, yeah, I'm definitely gonna, not carbon neutral. I'm gonna keep going here, and then and then I'm gonna I'm gonna pause after buildings to see if they give additional examples. Um, and so with the buildings, for instance, now an eligible certainly an eligible expense is if if an entity wants to purchase a facility to use as a green job training center. The purpose of that building is, is, is the purchasing the entirety of the building, and ideally, it would it would be an efficient building. But the purchase of that building is for one of our funding areas. Now, this is not to say, obviously, we 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 do fund, and we had several project proposals where we're funding a whole range of elements of a particular development that's associated with making it more efficient. It's just one or when when would the wholesale purchase of a building be an eligible expense. And that's sort of where we're trying to bring that nuance because we did receive those applications last round where we, we received applications for folks seeking to purchase buildings that did not necessarily connect with any of our underlying funding areas in, in, in necessary in, in long-term or, or even at times short-term use. Um, and so, for instance, an in, what we describe as an ineligible expense would be the purchase of a building for use as affordable housing. Now, again, those if, if, if someone was developing an affordable housing project and wanted to use PCEF to fund its efficient, its particular, you know, efficiency improvement, solar, whatever else, that certainly is an eligible expense. So I just want to make sure that distinction is there, that it's about really the, the purchase of an entire building or the purchase of, of land and, and tying it to the program. Okay. Unless it's net zero, right, Sam? It's partially there, unless it's net zero. That's right, thank you. Thank you, unless it's net zero, that's right. Yeah, so it's maybe the- an existing net, sorry. It's, no, no, it's go ahead. Just to clarify, were you asking if it was, unless it's an existing net zero building that is pre being purchased for the purpose of affordable housing? Or a renovation that takes an existing building and makes it net zero, harder to do, but mm -hmm. right. But mm -hmm. also land, if you were going to build a net zero affordable housing, I'm assuming, right? Given this, the way this example is set up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, one comment or concern that I had, the reason I was making the faces when you were reading this is, and maybe things have changed so much and gotten more solidified in the last few years where I haven't been paying as close of attention to buildings. Um, net zero was a term of art, at least a few years ago, that people used very differently. Um, and include, we had just had a little bit of a flavor of that conversation even here with Michael's question, right? That So it's also kind of like picking a brand and saying, yeah, we'll go with that one over this other one. So this to me says, a, particular set of criteria that some people in our marketplace are um, embracing and some people around the nation are embracing over some other things, right, that, that are happening. Um, passive house, for example, or living building. Um, I mean, a living building might be net zero, but um, anyway, um, that, that was what my face was, is it felt one, like a little bit uh, undefined, still undefined, or le uh, left up to definition of whoever our applicant is, um, or who our reviewers are. And the other piece was it at least a few years ago, this would be like picking a particular brand over another kind of brand. So I would be concerned about that if that was still the case. 
Hey, that's uh, that's uh, uh, wait, I'll, I'll wait I just first. wanted to make sure. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that Robin had a chance to jump in here before we got too far along. Robin. Uh, yeah, going back to eligible expense for buildings, um, what prevents someone from applying and say, yeah, we'll do a green jobs training center, but in three years they pivot and, you know, no longer do a green jobs training center, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a, a, a food assembly, you know, center or something like that, that is totally not related to PCEF. That's the next slide. So let's okay. hold I'll on wait. to that thought, and maybe Sam, if you had some, if you had something you wanted to say in response to to Faith's comment about net zero um, not, not development, other than other than Faith, I think your your point's taken, and I think that there is still more work to do to shape that one out. I know that this was a conversation piece that was playing out with, you know, even the the the. The, the Portland Housing Bureau and its affordable housing projects and what particular standards they were going to choose for their projects. So I know that they, I, I, it, it's, it's, an, it's an absolutely valid point. So there's still, a, I think we're still talking with partners um, and, and gathering data to see sort of what the right level is and see just whether, whether, whether there is something that can, that can speak to a, a handful of different standards without necessarily picking, picking the, 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 the particular flavor of the month or whatever else. So I think, but 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 this is it's it's it, it, but this does this thinking at least is that we we've, we've heard interest clear interest in in seeing in seeing PCEF do this and I think in, in seeing PCEF be relevant for these sorts of investments and I think that it's it's something that we still as a region it's still something that isn't that doesn't just the market just doesn't do and so there is there isn't there's an incentive need for it um, and so. We're just trying to figure out what would be the right what, what what would be the right boundaries to carve around that. And so we'll, we've still got our work to do before we, we come back to you all with that similar thing. Can I ask a, a, just a little clarifying question that might be helpful for us moving forward? Faith, if if we were to say something like net zero, recognizing that that's not zero carbon, which would be sort of the case that Michael's talking about, where we would really like consider the embedded cost, but net zero from an operating perspective. Um, and then if it were, because we've heard interest in that, and we've also heard interest in living building, and there is sort of like, an, you know, an, an energy pedal there, are the, you know, the, if the living building has the difference. So if it was a living, we were going to say, if it was living building, we would like to have that particular pedal. Would that feel like enough clarity for us to be able to evaluate? Or are there, is there sort of, is there a bigger conversation there that needs to be had? I personally would like a bigger conversation because that, that's two brands, okay. Katie. In, in the yeah. way in which I framed it, that's now, okay, now you have two instead of one. Um, by the way, I support mm -hmm. both of those. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But it's, you know, like that, those aren't the only two, for example. Mm -hmm. So there might be just a way of defining it in a more general way that gets to our direct point, maybe, or maybe it's not an issue anymore. But I, mm -hmm. I would like for myself to at least to do a little bit of updating of my knowledge to make sure. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're a couple minutes past the time when we said we were gonna go on a break. I am um, wanna, I would like to ask you all to hang in with us so that Sam can get through the next slide because it's just one more slide on this and then we can bump the break and the sort of team building exercise. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, transfer of property. <laughs> so this is this is a language when we we talked about this a good bit before our last RFP. And so in the last RFP, one of the um, one of the things that we went back and forth, and we kind of landed on this language in the final draft that went out was just that you know some types of property. You know, example given real property, personal property valued above a certain threshold obtained with PCEF funds, either in full or in part, may require the grantee to notify the city and receive approval for transfer of ownership of the property. The city's approval to transfer of ownership will not be unreasonably withheld. So that was sort of the language we landed on in order to make sure that we're not we 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 want to give folks the, the you know we want to give folks the the room to be able to adapt to their own needs, but also um, be able to be able to 
keep some 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 sort of pulse. So Robin, in a sense, we're trying to we're trying to straddle. I think Robin, a little bit of what you had just asked this question you had asked of what 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 prevents someone from just going and changing and something hold altogether something different um, versus making sure it, you know groups have the flexibility to respond to the, the needs that they see in front of them too. So that that was the language you came for, and so you know these are a couple of questions that. You know, we wanted to just kind of come back and pose as we as we come back for this next round where we expect that we probably there's a good likelihood we will see building our land acquisition proposals is just as we come back around and we have those you know what criteria should we think about evaluating how these certain instances are handled under what circumstances does it feel reasonable to say an organization can or cannot transfer a property without being penalized um so But that's that's the questions to you all, and 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 I don't I don't think we I don't I know given the timing I don't I, I think if there are a couple of thoughts a couple of comments certainly welcome that now, but I know that this this may be one that you all want to think about, and we're happy to also just let this be one that folks think about and and, and follow back up with us since we're kind of bringing this back up to you all now. Robin? Um, yeah, I have I, just a couple of general thoughts about some of these questions. Um, first thing I think, um, you know, what I, I don't want happening is people flipping properties. Um, and, you know, I think this language here kind of uh, supports that. But, you know, I just, yeah, I don't want, to, you know, some organization coming in, getting the funds, three years later, flipping it and making some money off that. I, I don't think that's the intent of, of the organization, uh, of, of the funding. Um, I think we should also give some thought about whether these funds can be used for debt refinancing. So maybe an organization has a mortgage on a property and you know they want to um, use PCF funds to pay down their, their loan. Um, I haven't fully thought that through. There are pros and cons about that, but I think that's something that you know we should you know contemplate whether you know PISA funds are eligible for that purpose or or not. And like I said, there's pros and cons, uh, and I think it's worth a, a, a deeper uh, conversation. Um, and I think uh, you know in terms of transferring, I, I, I think you know property. I, I think it's okay so long as the original intent of the the grant proposal is still intact. Um, you know, if it's transferring to another organization and the mission of the property and the use of the property is is kind of still intact, then I think it's okay. Uh, but if if it's a you know wholesale transfer and it's just used for some other different purpose um, within a relatively short time frame, I, I have some issues with that. So. Those are just some of my initial reactions. I, I might have some more thoughts uh, about that. Michael? So I guess my, um, my question was, I remember when this first came up from our first round and, um, and I, my my issue is sort of the opposite of Robin's issue, which is that um, I'm not sure it's our job to uh, police what people do with their property um, after grants are funded. Um, but I don't have a problem with a uh, property be put into a trust, like being held by a trust, right? Um, for example, but I don't think that, uh, I think that once a grant is out and completed, I'm, I'm not sure that it is the government's job to oversee what the property owners do. You know, it's, it just, it, it feels too HUD-like, um, too traditional, too, too, uh, intervention -y to, to we don't trust you uh, to make your own best decisions. Um, it, it just sort of, it, 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 I'm, I'm not sure that that's logical, um, but it, it sure feels that way to me. Um, but I would also like to, I, you know, I'd like to see how trusts might work, how land trusts might work, um, how it could be worded for that, like, you know, this needs to be for the good of the communities in which it's supposed to serve or, 
you know, to hold, hold it that way, right? So that if it does get transferred, that it gets transferred to, you know, to um, if, if title and D gets transferred, that gets transferred to an organization that uh, sort of has the same leanings, but um, hopefully, uh, but I don't, I don't know. That, those are just my concerns. And so you all have this, you know, you all have the slides in these languages. I'd love for you all to just sit with this and see if, if you know, I, I, I hear that. And I guess I want to know Michael in some ways. I know we're over now. We're well over. If this language feels like the, the original language from the first round, feel, if, if, it, if, if there are just any thoughts in one direction or the other of where, where this could be adjusted. I know we were trying to straddle this then and, and, and coming back to this now um, would be helpful to um, as you look at that, because that, that 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 was the language that went out with the R with the last RFP. Maybe we can come back to this conversation um, at the next meeting or in individual conversations. I think that there's. Um, and if there's additional information folks feel like might be helpful for, to them in thinking about this, like maybe some scenarios or examples of, um, of what other funders do and don't do and how that might look, um, I think that we can provide some of that too if it feels like that would be helpful. Maybe just um, shoot an email to Samurai. Okay, so now we're at the part of the meeting where we get a five minute break. And then we're gonna move into two um, breakout groups and um, we might lose Robin before we come back from the breakout group. So thank you, Robin, for being at the beginning of the meeting. And um, for members of the public, um, you can stay in the main air, in the main room, the breakout, um, the breakout rooms during this meeting are just for staff or just for committee members. So um, staff and members of the public won't be able to go into them, but we'll all reconvene at um, 725. So five minute break and then committee members, you'll be moved into your breakouts.
Um, we are going to make a slight adjustment to the agenda um, just because the workforce um, the workforce training and contractor support grants is a it's an important conversation that we don't want to get squeezed. And so we're going to kind of bump the grant cap, returning to the grant cap conversation. That um, which we'll touch on we'll touch on briefly at the next meeting, maybe if we have time at the end of this meeting. Um, but it, it is it's not so much it's not really an FYI, but it's a little bit more just sort of like informational than and um, less we sort of still need to get to get a lot of your guidance. So we wanted to um, make sure there was enough time to talk to really talk about the workforce training um, and contractor support grants. So that unless anybody has um, kind of has takes issue with that or thinks that that's a bad idea, I think that's that's how we'll move forward. Seem good? All right. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Sam then, to, who will be introducing Jay, who will be um, presenting to you all on this topic. Thank you, Katie. So PCEF is unique in that we have, a, as part of the fund, 20 25% goes towards workforce development, and we have talented staff member Jay Richmond managing that, that portfolio. And so as we were in, in the last round of, of grants, what we saw in this area were a variety of grants and, and, and certainly a tremendous amount of interest. It's probably the area of the, the portfolio where there's some of the most interest relative to the amount of funding um, that there is in, in the funding area. And as we talk about this, and this is information Jay is going to share shortly, but the reason that we're pre presenting this conversation to you all is Last round was 8.6 million. Folks are just getting socialized and used to the idea. But what we saw within this portfolio in the last round, and, and Jay will speak to specifics, is that we saw a, a range of proposals that were really tailored towards, you know, uh, the, the the things that we tended to think about for workforce development, as well as some things that that were novel, innovative, pushing the envelope that were further upstream, that were looking at youth exposure to clean energy field and, and, and other things like that. And, and what we just, as we started to see then, as we are engaging in conversations with nonprofit organizations, others that are looking and expressing interest in PCEF, we recognize that as, as, as you know, PCEF takes a few years, but as it gets more and more socialized, we're gonna get more applications. And so we're certainly express, expecting to see more of those upstream um, proposals that are focused on potentially youth or just further upstream. And, and Jay will detail what that looks like. And so we want to make sure that you all have this conversation today and really think about the kind of proposals you want to see. Um, and, and so that's really what why we're having this is that we saw we saw a certain interest and Jay will speak to that. And, and we expect to see more just as as people get socialized to the different ways and different things that PCEF can fund. So without 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 taking up more time, I'm really excited that whether we get to have Jay Richmond present to you all, and um, we'll 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 say no more. Um, Jay, please please carry on. Thanks so much, Sam, for that introduction. Can everybody hear me all right? Awesome. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to talk about the workforce and contractor development funding area, with the goal of getting your input on future funding priorities. In order to ground this presentation, I want to read what the code says about this funding area. Next slide, please. Twenty-five percent, twenty to 25% clean energy jobs training, apprenticeship, and contractor support. This category is intended to support nonprofit programs that directly facilitate and promote job training, free apprenticeship programs, apprenticeship programs, and contractor training and support that are primarily aimed at supporting economically disadvantaged and traditionally underrepresented workers in the skilled workforce. B, programs supporting entry into union registered apprenticeship trades shall be a high priority. I'll just let us go to the next slide, please. Uh, through the first RFP process, we saw that workforce and contractor development projects generally fell into three different categories. The first of these categories is the one that includes pre-apprenticeship and workforce training programs. Just to give a little bit of context, I like to talk about the demographics of the trades pre-COVID. 
pre-COVID, the trades were uh, 94% men, 6% women, 20% of the people in the trades in general were people of color and uh, leading those people of color in representation were the Latino community. Uh, Black and Asian Pacific Islander people were un are underrepresented in the trades. Uh, so we saw some proposals from organizations like Portland Youth Builders, Constructing Hope, POIC, Oregon Tradesmen, and APANA. Uh, these programs train workers and give them the skills to either directly enter the field of choice or enter apprenticeship programs for further training and on-the-job experience. Uh, generally, ten to twelve thousand dollars in investment is put into each participant. Uh, this investment leads to careers that have starting wages of forty-five to fifty-five thousand dollars, depending on the trade or field they decide to enter. Currently funded workforce training programs outreach to and report recruit women and people of color into fields where they are uh, currently underrepresented. Uh, Pre-apprenticeship pre and other training programs generally offer wraparound services and mentorship during and after their programs, which leads to increased retention of women and people of color. So those wraparound services look like uh, gas cards, emergency rent stipends, uh, signing up folks for things that they're eligible like OHP, SNAP, and TANF. Uh, they also help folks get access to mental health resources and all these programs give uh, free boots and tools that uh, are needed to enter the trade. Uh, the benefit of these uh, pre-apprenticeship programs is some of them have direct entry into registered apprenticeship, which lowers one of the largest barriers for priority communities. Next slide, please. The next category of project proposals that we see in the contractor support and the, or, 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 the next category of project proposals are in the, cat, the contractor support and uh, development category. Organizations like MISO, NAMAC, ONAC, Latino Built provide a wide range of support for current and prospective business owners entering or expanding in the market. Uh, that support looks like giving historically marginalized workers access to capital, need, access to the capital needed to starting their own businesses. They give help with providing and provide assistance with acquiring business and professional licenses, uh, help with obtaining and increasing bonding capacity, and help receiving other uh, certifications. That help also looks like providing training and education in job costing, bidding, estimating, marketing, and project procurement that underrepresented groups may not otherwise have access to. Next slide, please. Our last category of project proposals that we saw were projects that focus on exposure and are skill building regarding clean energy careers, but didn't have an expectation of immediate job placement or business creation upon completion of the, pro the program, their program. Um, examples of these projects include proposals from Camp Elso, the Blueprint Foundation, Black Community of Portland, uh, projects like these range in scope from community engagement, youth education, general climate awareness, and uh, community organizing. Give you guys a second. Generally, youth education and awareness programs provide exposure to climate education and issues that youth who belong to historically marginalized communities may not otherwise have access to. Youth programs can help to demystify the entry process into apprenticeship programs and other opportunities in their trades that are not known to or generally accessible to the uh, general public. And currently there is a lack of noble connection between the K through 12 system and clean energy jobs. It used to be that um, in schools, they have a recruiter come out and get the folks directly into register apprenticeship. And they'd also have uh, like wood shop and stuff like that, but that's not the case any longer. So outreach and marketing efforts around green sector jobs are largely not targeted to marginalized communities. So climate education and awareness can contribute to, to, to diversification of the industry. And finally, research suggests that successful recruitment solutions need to be multifaceted, long-term, 
and the recruitment of women and people of color, especially in the green sector, needs to include increased marketing targeted to these populations among all age are among all age ranges. Something that you often hear quoted in the workforce training sector is that you can't see it if you can't be it if you can't see it. Ooh, it kind of gets cut off at the end here. But one thing that we want to know is that it's challenging to tie uh, investment in this uh, project category with uh, downstream outcomes. So we can't we we can't say that investing ten thousand dollars in uh, youth and um, exposure will result in somebody getting a job in the trade. Next slide, please. What we saw in RFP1. In RFP1, 51% of applications for implementation grants, not including planning grants, were either workforce alone or had a workforce component. 27% were exclusively workforce and contractor development projects. Of 21 applications for implementation grants that were exclusively workforce and contractor development projects, 67% had some direct job training component, 24% had some contractor development component, and 29% were indirect exposure and are still going. I apologize for the background just now. Somebody was having fun on their motorcycle. Um, what type of workforce and contractor implementation grants got funded? A little bit more than half of funding went to projects that were exclusively about exposure and skill building. Um, the remainder went to projects that were more directly job training focused. One of them was construction for construction workforce and the other was increased green skill within, within an existing workforce. Uh, unfortunately, there were no uh, funded projects for contract support, but we anticipate seeing uh, that, not, that not being the case in the next round. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to skip these first two bullet points. So the clarity that we're seeking right now is that we anticipate seeing a lot of applications in category three, youth and exposure. Um, while there is interest and value in funding these types of programs, we have a concern that this area could overwhelm the workforce and contractor development funding allocation. We want to get feedback to clarify your priorities and values around this funding area so that we can develop the RFP in alignment with them. Next slide. So we, get, we want you to uh, go into breakout sessions and discuss the following things. Staff recommends that we prioritize uh, pre-apprenticeship and workforce training programs, plus contractor support and development. Prioritization could happen through additional points for certain project types or through a maximum amount of funding for allocated, allocated to type three projects. Uh, we are interested in hearing your feedback on the recommendation and in hearing their values and desires in, related, in relation to this funding area. Uh, and with that, I will kick it to Sam and maybe give some time for questions because I feel like I ran through that really quickly. Okay, thank you. I think that that was really great. And what I'll just share is I think given the tightness of the group that, that, that we have a few, uh, a couple less people than we expected, I think that I, I think enough folks are interested. I think we we could we, we may be able to be in a good shape here with the, with the five folks here, not going to breakout groups. So I just wanted to offer that, and, and unless folks are particularly interested. Okay, great job, thank you. And we're happy to elaborate on some of just what we're some of any of those pieces that, and some of what we expect to see. But I hope that it's clear that what we're what we know is that with I think that it's there are a lot of folks that didn't necessarily see PSEF as funding some of those upstream um, youth focused projects. We certainly had people put in those proposals and as, as, as folks saw that in the, in, the, in the first round, I think that what, what we're expecting is that just as folks get the sense that, oh, PSEF can fund that, we're expecting to see a lot more of those. Um, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a substantial, it's a, it's a large ecosystem of, of organizations that play in that space. And we just wanna make sure that you all are aware of that and, and can have that open conversation. And so we we've, we've, think I'll leave you there and then you see some of the staff recommendation, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that.
Michael? I was actually going to ask Jeffrey what kind of um, what kind of uh, barriers or troubles he's had with recruiting workforce, um, and if he's had any trouble with um, sort of that uh, construction and that blue collar work is uh, is an option to higher education um, or you know a, a college degree versus versus going uh, directly into the workforce through an apprenticeship or uh, the like. Yeah, um, well, to answer the, the latter part, which you said, I actually recommend uh, people going into the trades over college if they don't know what they wanna do because it's a way, it's always a good skill to have and you can always fall back on it. A lot of people say is that the skills that pay the bills I think a lot of people, especially in our community, have not been exposed to that and been intentionally locked out of it. So it's one of the biggest things that I think needs to be more promoted in our community. Like, like I said, it's always a good fallback. You can always go and if you're electric, if you have electric electrician background, you always could go back and do a house if you know if you fall on hard times. There's always there's always infrastructure work going on, regardless. You know, that's one of the, as we saw with COVID, one of the, one of the few industries that kept going was construction. So that's one of the things that's recession proof. Will always be going to, will always be happening so i think we need to be promoting that more in the communities of color because of that um, as far as retaining people the biggest thing that i see is lack of representation you can put somebody through a pre-apprenticeship program you can put them you know even get them get them in the union but if you take them somewhere out in central oregon where they see a confederate flag every day and got to be you know uh demoralized all the time no there's not, not an amount of money don't they won't care how much money you're making at that point nobody's dignity is worth that so the biggest thing you need is to have people that look like you to understand your play, understand, you know, your culture, so that you feel more comfortable to uh, to stay and actually, you know, learn the skills that you need. A lot of times, people also get marginalized in those scenario in those scenarios where they don't pick up the skills because people aren't willing to teach them, or there's a there's a cultural gap or whatnot, you know. And people, you know, just by human nature, you want to you gravitate toward people that are more like you. So that's why it's very important that we get more people, more contractors that look like the people we're trying to um that we're trying that we're trying to get out and trying to help get into the trades because if you don't have that you're not going to get the retention that you're looking for or get the people the support that you want and the last thing is the, the kid component is a big thing i work with kids I, I i have a youth program that i work with and these kids don't even consider construction as a, as a as an option they don't half the time i talk to them they all they to talk about the things they see you know want to be athlete entertainer or they want to be a barber or something like that especially in my community. And, and that's because they don't see representation. So that's why I, and and with my thing, I, the biggest thing is all, every day I work with is in the trades and to kind of show them that it's a different route. You know, you can do something, you know, cause I need that representation. Somebody that looks like you, people don't like, even whether you agree with the politics or not, why Obama was so important to the black community. Just seeing that why um, our vice president is so, is so important to our community. You need to have that, whether you understand it or not really, I mean, you need it's just it's it is what it is you that is very very important so those are kind of my thoughts on um kind of some of the barriers that we're seeing as far as workforce and, and contractor development thanks for the question mike I'm going to uh, jump in and say that I think that I think that pre-apprenticeship and workforce training programs that uh, number one and two are probably the most important. Um, but I, I would like to back up what Jeffrey says. You know, I spend a lot of time at, uh, at Donald Long Juvenile Justice Corrections, and uh, and I pop into the classrooms and I talk to the kids uh, informally because all the classes are pretty informal. But uh, you know, and I'm just like, hey, you know. Uh, I'm an electrician. You see me around here all the time. I was like, and the fact is, is that like the trades pay good money. I'm like, I make, you know, and I tell them what I make, you know, I'm like, I make over a hundred thousand dollars a year doing this. I'm like, and the trades don't care that you're in here right now. The trades, like if you have your math done, if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to like, you know, start out on the bottom and uh, and know that you've got a steep learning, you gotta learn a lot of stuff. Um, I'm like, it's, it's, 
it's a great place to go. I'm like, and you know, you don't have to go to college for this. Uh, you got to get a GED for this. Um, and it's, it's a great way to make a really good living. Um, I'm like, you know, you can be a carpenter. A carpenter makes as much as I do. You know, you can, you can be a plumber, make more money than I do. Be a pipe fitter or a welder, make more than I do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a good way to go. Um, you know, and, and nobody cares about your current, like no one's gonna hold your current troubles against you. Um, wh whatever you're here for, no, no one's gonna hold it against you in the trades. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I try to, you know, and nobody's heard about it, right? It's, it's like Jeffrey said, it's athlete, entertainer. Um, that's, that's sort of what they're looking at and what, what they're trying to be. And I'm like, you know, I'm like there, there's other stuff out there that, you know, will make you that money. Um, you know, um, I'm like, I make a million dollars every nine years. <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a bad life and you can do it too. Um, and, uh, and then I give them my email address and tell them to get a hold of me if they got any questions and I can point them in the right direction. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, so I think that, that I guess at the end of my long story here is that I think that some, uh, high school, junior high school age outreach, um, uh, funding can be helpful if it's like really well targeted. Um, I think that it's just, if it's just generally targeted, I'm not sure how great it is. I think it needs to be really, really well targeted outreach. I, I think if we're just going to give money to Portland public schools to do a general outreach for green energy, it's, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that that's what we want to do. Um, if we're going to do a very specifically targeted um, to uh, peace have priority communities for uh, for junior high high school outreach. I think that's that's a good use of funds. Thanks. Did you have something that you wanted to can add? I was just noticing that maybe a disconnect. I loved your story, Michael and Jeffrey. Thanks for sharing your passion. Um, on that too, so that was really important. And what I, the disconnect is between that and what Jay presented around, or or maybe Sam actually, you said we think that there's a lot of people who are in this space. And Jay, in your presentation, you were saying, you know, like maybe people, maybe we didn't see a whole lot of this that first time because people didn't necessarily see themselves <laughs> being PSA funded. But if there are so many players in this space and so much interest in the space, why are, are Michael and Jeffrey's stories true? <laughs> is it is it because that, you know, they're not targeted programs? I have a feeling they might be expanding programs. Uh, that uh, they are they are non existent programs or programs that exist but aren't aren't targeting yeah like construction, right? Or uh, construction yes, Mike, for Mike, I think Mike, Michael Michael's correct. I think what we what we where we saw, and these are these are cursory looks at the numbers. I think there, there's once you do a deeper dive in the application, certainly that there's more there. But I think what we saw is that when we looked at like the you know clean energy has forty to sixty percent of funding. This has twenty to twenty five percent, and sort of there everything kind of tracked relatively, except this funding area. There's a lot of interest, and I think that's where we tended to see a lot more community groups, groups that have a, a, a history of providing more, um, you know, social services to the community, whether it is, uh, you know, whether it's housing related, whether it's a health related, uh, whether it's just more general education related um, focused on, and, and so there's a whole range of culturally specific organizations that have done that and others, but we saw a range of those organizations that um, have connections to the community that are doing this step, but, but that haven't been focused in the construction sector that, uh, and so, uh, and maybe providing job placement, um, career navigation services, again, though, not historic, not typically focused on, on construction uh, or, or the clean energy trade. So that's where we saw a lot of those. It was, it was sort of a, a, a more, what I suspect is, is easier to pivot to those areas because they're already doing a lot of programming 
as opposed to the, the, some of the, the clean energy in other areas tend to be more you, you're, you're going and building infrastructure. So it's just a Michael, the kind of guidance that you, the kind of, the, you know, guidance that you gave related to like what you would want to see is really useful for us, I think, to consider. I, you know, a lot of, we, because we did receive applications that were pretty targeted, and but we also received applications that were just STEM, right, that were just STEM education, which is super valuable and, but is not super specific. So I think that um, we are interested in kind of hearing from, you know, all of the, all of you as committee members, um, where you see the, not that one of these things is more important than the other, but just what is most appropriate for PSEF to prioritize. And I think, I feel like I have heard that from Michael and Jeffrey fairly, fairly clearly that these sort of one and two, this pre-apprenticeship and workforce training programs and contractor support and development are a higher priority than the third one, which is more about sort of exposure and skill building and sometimes more youth focused. Um, but I would be interested in hearing from other folks who um, are who are not in the who are not working in the trades directly, just so other committee members too, what your thoughts there are. I can jump in. Um, I definitely agree with uh, what Michael and Jeffrey said. I think um, right now there's a lot of funds, like there's a lot of funds that are going towards, I guess, education and um, skill building, especially for, for youth. Like there's a lot of good opportunities out there, but this is something that I personally haven't seen, but also I'm not very exposed to like the, um, the trades or like the uh, construction sector. So I'm not quite sure like how much pre-apprenticeship programs and workforce uh, training programs there are out there. But I know, for example, like my partner, he's definitely in construction and he does a lot of stuff and he identifies as Pacific Islander and he's very much like in there by himself. And it just, it's like, this is something that it's, you just don't see. So I really appreciate what both Michael and Jeffrey said. And I think it's something that really should be prioritized considering um, this is just something like Jeffrey mentioned, like it's, it's something that doesn't really go away, even when we're in a um, tough place in this country. Thanks, Amanda. Maria? Thanks everybody for your feedback. Um, I'm not exposed to a lot of pre-apprenticeship and contractor support um, type of uh, issues or elements in the work that I do. But recently I worked with some youth in East Portland um, on a program that would fall into the category of exposure and skill building. Um, at the end of the program though, there's just a huge appetite for young people, especially older teenagers, um, right before summer, wanting to know, like, are there part-time jobs in sustainability careers for teens, older teens, um, pre-college teens? Is there a way they can jump right into this work? Because they're um, really interested in sustainability issues, especially neighborhood level stuff. But, you know, at the end of the program, there's not a whole lot that they can offer you know, especially with you asking for compensation for things. So I, I worry though that there's a lot of um, investment into exposure and skill building um, and that it leads to more of this like transactional relationship with clients or people that they work with and folks are really hungry for some kind of employment or engagement, even part-time kind of work, especially for young people so that they can get some exposure. So. How do we like not downplay the importance of the exposure and skill building category stuff, but maybe raise the bar a little bit for, for the types of programs that we might fund in that category? So I, I think it makes sense to add points to, um, to pre-apprenticeships and contractor support type of stuff. 
but is there a way to also kind of elevate what exposure and skill building work can look like at the same time? Really appreciate that, Maria. Any other thoughts or questions? There's so few, so few of you. We're just zipping right through this. Are we going to be going over this again with like the fuller committee? I mean, I know we're only missing like four, four people, but are we going to be reviewing this again in the in a future meeting or maybe over email or something? Sam, it looks like you want to jump in. Yeah. Yeah, Amanda, what we'll be doing is we're going to be revisiting all of this as part of what we pulled together. When we, what we're going to do is a long form do a memo describing what are all the changes and how we reflected on the feedback that you've provided us around each of these areas leading into the next meeting and talking that through. So we are, you know, we are following up with committee members that couldn't make it this evening. Um, to talk through these individual components, but what we'll be doing when we come back to this is we'll come back to this as part of looking at all of this as a whole. And so, but but that said, if there's certainly interest in connecting with any individual committee member others, we can we can we can facilitate we can we can we can facilitate that too. Or, see Jay, your Jay. I kind of want to uh, pose a question to the committee. What do you, where would you put the priority of like K through five kind of program when in, in this ecosystem? Like how would, where, what would you want to see with that? Like is that at a lower priority or is that also important to you? Or K through six to be honest. Jessica, you I, I agree with what Mike said. Um, I think it's junior high and high school are the ones that you really want are the are the tar it's your target audience you really want to meet uh, reach. Like I, I went to uh, Benson High School, which is a tech school, and if I had known how much electrician made at that time, I might have actually went into the program. But I guess I did. I did. I was not. I did not get that information, and so that's kind of the things you don't you don't think about, you know, because you don't get get that exposure. So I think you know we need targeted. Um, we need people that are going to be targeting those 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 children. Like, why aren't why aren't we have programs at Harriet Tubman, where where it has a a whole bunch of our kids in there? Why don't we have more people going to Benson? We have a school that literally deals with some of the trades. Like I said, I went there and I don't remember people telling me much about you know the trades and that kind of stuff or how much I could be making. You know, so why go into debt forty k when you can go make sixty k right out of, at age as eighteen year old? I mean, somebody presented it to me that way. I'm like, oh, well, that makes that's, that's a little different, <laughs> you know, or, 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 or do this until you, you know, you figure out what you want to do, then go to college. And, hey, you might be able to pay for it yourself. You know, there's there's ways, you know, there's a way for us to present it to these kids, you know, but it's not being. And so I think those are the kids that are the ones that are trying to figure out what they want to do in life because you know, junior high, high school is when you're trying to figure out like, hey, do I want to go to college? I think the way, same way that college is being promoted to these kids, we need to promote uh the trades of these kids as well, at least so they know it's an option. The same way the military is promoted to them, the same way college is promoted to them, they, these things be promoted to them. And we need to find people that are going to be are going to be very strategic and very intentional about giving that exposure to them. But I think that's the age group you're looking for, Jay. Any other thoughts on that? I'll share if I if if you don't um, maybe Jay and Sam don't mind. I would just share this one thought, which is that um, we recently another coworker of ours who isn't here, but um, kind of elevated this like an example, and it was an example about um, like the sort of the point at which girls fall off in math, and sort of like that being really like the, that being potentially a an area for critical intervention. So. 
if girls perform really well in math until around fifth grade, I think is, is what it was that it's like, sort of like, that's the spot where you can actually kind of like really leverage change. And I, um, so I, I just wanted to throw that out there mostly just because I think there's so much that there, there are so, there are so many, like, just because there are things that we don't know that we don't know that other people might know are like a really good spot to kind of intervene and make a difference in um, someone's kind of trajectory or their life. So um, I totally hear what you're saying and, and it resonates Jeffrey and Michael with the sort of middle school. I mean, we all went through that special hell and came out the other side, but, um, but also we might want to leave some flexibility for um, to be able to allow things that, you know, we don't know, we don't know yet. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, you know, because we're always talking prioritization, right? And so, you know, I think that if it's, you know, I think that if we're doing, I don't know, it, it feels like, yeah, I, I think once again, it has to be looked at uh, like we do all applications, right? Like we do all, all grant applications one at a time. Uh, and um, sort of the validity of each and the information presented in that, right? Because I am clearly not an expert on uh, childhood development and education. Uh, and, uh, but if somebody comes to us with something that is important on point and is, you know, a fall off point or a place where, um, where, you know, where that where information that they want to give that's PCF related really makes a difference. I, I have no problem with that. If it takes place in fifth grade, if it takes place in fourth grade, if it takes place in kindergarten. Um, I, I think that, I think as we look at prioritization though, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I guess that it would be, it would kind of go from you know, pre-apprenticeships and workforce training programs, which is usually post high school or close to post high school. Um, and then moving down sort of the age brackets and priority would, uh, it, it is sort of how I would almost think about it. Um, I would also say, I would like to see it, you know, very specifically targeted funds, right? Not just general funds. Um, you know, uh, it's it's one thing to say we want to you know teach all fifth graders about green energy. You know that that's wonderful, and I think that falls into the PCF mission. I think if you say we would like to teach kids at these schools from these priority populations about green energy and um, and uh, and uh, you know climate crisis and everything at the fifth grade level, you know, whatever. I think that's more important that has a higher priority to it. Um, so I'm just gonna, yeah, leave it there. Thanks, Michael. So, I, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna ask this question maybe to refine it. I, I, I'm, I'm hearing very clearly around the high priority, high, uh, seeking and making, you know, seeking prioritization for focus, um, for interventions or efforts that are focused on particular populations, and making sure that whatever effort it, it's a targeted, it's a targeted program on on, on a particular population, on, pro on one of our piece of priority populations. From a curriculum perspective, you know, we've talked about things ranging from STEM, STEM exposure, STEM education. And 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 acknowledging that that is a key that can that may be a key intervention point for that also may be a key intervention point all the way to direct sort of um, exposure to hey here here's a program that's going to bring in folks from the trades to talk to you about the jobs and the specific things there so that you actually have a, a sense for that 
just so that as we're thinking through, because this is an area, this is an area of the application that we're, we're working quite a bit on. So we're thinking through those and how we ask those and then ultimately certainly how we prioritize those. Are you, are we, did, did, did I hear also prioritization around the, the type of curriculum or, or programming too for, for, for ones that are more speaking to the specifically to the, 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 the career opportunities? Um, yeah, I would say uh, yes. Uh, I think what he was talking about is like just it has to be very targeted. It can't be general, like he said, like giving a bunch of money to PPS. Like that's just not going to work. Um, I'm, I was in that system, so it's just making sure that we're giving it to people that are very targeted as to who who they're trying to to reach in general, and then what the message is. You know, whether it be as specific as hey, they're talking, all we want to talk about is being electric, uh, getting to electrician union, what that is. You know, that's very general. Kids could grasp onto that. Just keeping them, whatever that is. But I just, as an example, making it a very concise message for the kids, but keeping it as, you know, general as possible. Uh, you know, when you make it too generalized, that's when, you know, things get lost in translation, in my opinion. I think that's what Michael's also speaking to, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. Thank you. I think that gives us. I think that gives us. That gives us good information that we can we can work with and, and come back to you all with. I, I understand that, that, that you're that trying to give a message to uh, grant application uh, potential grant appli applicants, um, and so I think that, and, and you know, kind of saying you know this is this is what we're looking to fund this year. Um, and I'm assuming that we're going to be doing this again next year, next funding cycle, and then the funding cycle after that, and refining this over and over. So, um, I guess, I guess, uh, to, yeah, I, I, I think that Jay, you probably got some idea of what we're talking about, um, having come from uh, uh, apprenticeship and workforce training program world. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I guess. Yeah, I hope you guys can come back with something that feels like it does have prioritizations and very kind of very specific prioritizations um, for this next round. That feels good, Sam. I know you may. That does, that does. And Jay, if it's a quick, I think I know you might have had a question. I don't know if 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 if, 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 if. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, what if we saw a program that uh, kind of gave uh, probably high school students exposure to the green careers that aren't construction, but are things like becoming an engineer or a green architect or like green designers, like what, where would you categorize that? Are all those things sound good to you? <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds good to me. Yeah, of course. Again, I think the biggest thing is is it being targeted, you know, and and getting people that have not you know traditionally had that exposure to that the exposure they need to get into that. So as long as it's targeted, as long as it's you know targeted towards people we we our priority populations, I think you know I'm all for that. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. We feel like we're ready to move on from this conversation. I feel like we got what we need from you. There are a lot of kind of, I have a lot of, like, what if we got an application for this? Or what if we got an application for that? Questions running through my head. But I think that we can kind of leave, leave those. Um, and then maybe Sam, do you want to, I think we might have time to go back to the grant camp conversation. And then um, before we close out, does that seem like a good idea? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Thank you, Jay. Hey, I think we, thank you. Yes, thank you, Jay. Great, great job, Jay. Um, so I think that we want to come back to this 
conversation. We've presented this before, and we're going to come back to this again, as you see, sort of as we package the, 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 the rest of the RFP. But we wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the grant caps that we're thinking about. Um, you'll, and, and this is this is really a recall from a previous conversation we had. Um, but there's a there's one change in there that, that we have sort of updated. So um, let's move to the next slide, and we'll talk through this and, and, and talk about the, the shifts. Next slide, there we go. So as you all recall, the planning grants in the first RFP were $100,000 and it was a relatively simple application. It did exactly what I think we wanted to do in terms of the applications that we received and, and, and certainly the, the proposals that ultimately got awarded and the work that we're getting to do with them. So we're recommending leaving that as is. Um, you know, This was an application that was designed for folks that could be at the very early stages of their process or just needed some more time to work on and work through their idea. And so right now, I think given, given how well that, that application worked, uh, we're recommending leaving that as is. The small grants cap, and we've discussed this before, small grants cap last round was about $200,000. We recommend increasing that to $500,000. Um, at least, you know, 75% of round, round one small grant, small grants were for about, you know, 100,000 and 45% of all grants were for $500,000 or less. Um, so we, we think we could, pretend, and we probably will slightly increase the information um, for this application, but uh, it's still gonna be lower than the large grant application. So I think that that, that, that application, it, by increasing to $500,000, we still get a lot of information in that application that doesn't substantially change, we think the amount of risk that we're, that we're, we're, we're taking on by increasing the cap for the amount of information we're getting. Large, I think this is where you're gonna see the biggest change is really in the large grant. The large grant cap in the first round was a million dollars. And for this next round, we're recommending increasing the cap to $10 million. And it's important to remember, this isn't necessarily a year, you know, certainly an organization could propose spending a grant in one year, but they could also propose it in five years. So what this does for many organizations is it allows them to have potentially up to pretty sustainable funding for up to five years. You could see an organization spending $2 million every year for five years. And so when you think about, in many regards, some of the overhead, and let's say they got, they, they have 20% overhead, for an organization, that could be a scenario where they've got at least you know four hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, if they apply for the max ten million over five years, they'd have up potentially four hundred thousand dollars that can go towards their overhead and support that. So there's just other considerations as, or as organizations and projects that uh, scale up. That um, being able to get a large grant and have that that have that certainty for many years is, is, is gonna be important for some organizations. But we certainly could see a project also come in with a proposal to spend that to those sort of resources in a shorter period of time. And this is the change. We had originally talked about um, having the innovation or other funding category potentially be limited to small grants, which would have limited to $500,000. But based on just some of what we heard from you all um, a couple meetings ago, we're not recommending a cap on the innovation or other funding area. We will be coming back and recommending allocations for that, for, for, for transportation. But, but as far as any particular caps in the grant size, we are not, uh, we will not be recommending um, a, a cap for those. So you could certainly see a scenario where one grant could get that full allocation, which that allocation for that funding area would be roughly $3 million on a $60 million uh, RFP. And so what and, and so what this the implications of this is ultimately what we're trying to do is get a ballpark and back into you know a, a, a balance and you'll see this in the next slide just a balance of numbers of proposals to line up with ultimately certainly staff capacity um, and so what we would ultimately do is we would we we, we we're going to need a mix of grant sizes to come in and we're going to want to be able to signal intentions as part of this next RFP and so what this could look like would be an intention that we'd like to fund somewhere in the realm. And we'll figure out the right language for this, but that'd be starting to signal ranges. So we'd like to fund something around the range of 25 planning grants, um, uh, 20 million in small grants, 40 million in large grants. And, and so in trying to, and we don't know exactly what the exact number of actual grants are going to be, obviously it's gonna depend on the particular sizes of the individual grants that are awarded. And so there's there's a little bit of that that is just that that's just going to be the magic that comes through at the end, um, but it's going to be important that 
we were able to signal so folks have a sense for the kind of proposals that they can develop um, based on saying, what, what do we want to see? And so um, this is, so, so I'll, I'll leave this here. And welcome, and, and at this point really, well, and, and know that we will come back as we, you know, there's many different allocations that we've discussed in, in, in part. And so we're gonna come back to this because this will certainly play into, um, you know, how are we prioritizing, you know, in the previous conversation, the workforce development projects, um, how are we, um, uh, so it'll come back to some of these other pieces. It'll come back to other, other pieces, but, um, want to make sure we sit here and, and let this sink in a little bit one more time before we come back to you all before the public comment period, which will certainly be, this is an area within the public comment period, which we will be drawing folks' attention to and, and, and asking for feedback. Are there any questions? Does that all kind of make sense? It's a lot of numbers on the last two slides, lots of bullets and numbers. Um, so if you're seeing it for the first time, I think it can be a little bit, kind of a lot. I would just like to say that um, as you send this out for public review, um, especially about the uh, approximately 50 implementation grants, um, I think it's gonna be really important to also stress the capacity of staff to implement these grants and the numbers of grants. Um, you might get pushed back that no, you know, it's $60 million, you should be doing more like 100 grants. Um, so I think it, it will be important to also put out there in the public as you put this, what the capacity of, of the PCEF staff is to implement. Michael, it's, 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 um, it's incredibly important. It, it, it means something in terms of our ability to service these grants well. Any other additional thoughts on this one? We should have had more things on the agenda, maybe next time. We'll put even more things on the agenda. <laughs> I don't want you to take our silence as disinterest. This makes sense to me. So I fully, I'm with you. Great. Thanks, Faith. I, I think that we can probably move on then to committee member comments, unless, Sam, you want to use this time um, for something else. And then we can wrap up and, and call it a night. You know, it, what I would, what, what I think is just as you all, you know, as, as I think what, as I'm reflecting on a little bit of, of, of a range of things that we've pulled together here, I might in follow up, there's a, there's a couple of pieces of follow up that I'm thinking about in, 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 in follow up to this, this particular meeting that I want to get out pretty shortly here. And, and what I might just do is send along, like, again, reiterate, here are the list of topics that we've discussed in the past several meetings. And just see if there is if there's any area as we do that, if there's any particular area that you're like, I want to I want to understand a little bit more about this particular section, just so that we we can start to hear, we can start to get signaled so that as we kind of focus, as we think about how we bring this all back to you all and structure this information and write the pros and cons of each of these things, you know, there's a lot here. And so we're gonna have to be strategic in what we elevate and what we really try to really explain. And so what I would just appreciate is see those prompts. Okay, these are all the things that we've discussed. Um, and, and if there's something in there that you're like, I really, I want to learn, I want to hear a little bit more, just so we know that that's an area that we want to flesh out a little bit more. Um, it's, it's, it's just going to be, it's, it's going to be an exercise for us that we go back and we're going to be thinking about how to just bring all this information together. And so any, any nudges for areas of information that you, you're particularly interested in, and you want to understand better is, is always helpful to us. All right, any closing comments?
getting pretty close to the point where we have another draft RFP out for public comment. So things are getting, things are ramping up again. Um, so anything that, it's not a speak now or forever hold your peace kind of situation, but certainly we're looking for your input. Okay, I think then we can close the meeting and see you all in a couple of weeks. Um, if there's anything that comes up in the interim, reach out to um, Michael or Maria as your co-chairs, Sam or myself, and we can try and um, help you out. Michael, did you, were you just waiting because I said your name or did you want to say something? Oh, okay, yes, there he is. Okay. All right. Good night, you all.